So, hello everybody, thank you for uh, asking us to be here this afternoon and just uh, while um, we're getting the slides up. Um, my name is Monty and I'm the chief exec of an organisation called London Friend. Um, and a little bit about us, um, we are the oldest LGBT charity in the UK as far as we know. We've been around since 1972, very early in the days after male homosexuality began to be decriminalised and people started forming social bonds and wanting to connect and wanting to be open about who they were. We work in a range of health and well-being spheres, so we have a number of groups uh, supporting people coming out, exploring their gender identity or their sexual orientation, also social groups and activity groups for people who want to meet other LGBT people but maybe don't want to go into the bars and clubs scene. We work in mental health as well, so we have a counselling service. I think we're one of only three left in, the, uh, in London that's an LGBT-specific uh, counselling service. And within that, we also have a specialist domestic abuse counselling uh, programme as well. Uh, we also work in sexual health and HIV prevention, but it's our antidote drug and alcohol service that I think is the service we're most known for, and it's also the largest service that we, we run. Um, through that, we were one of the first services in the UK, if not the first, to identify this pattern of behaviour that's become known as chemsex. So what is it, chemsex? So, um, really, chemsex has been in the news quite a lot. So we've had a documentary a couple of years ago on chemsex. We've got plays coming into the fringe and off West End. This one was set in a sexual health clinic. This is a still from a play called Five Guys Chilling, which was set in a sex party, which is where most of the uh, chemsex activity happens. We've had it reported on Channel 4 and even on the, uh, the hallowed airways of uh, the Today programme on Radio 4 as well. So my bet is that chemsex is going to be in the archers by the end of the year. <laughs> so, mark my words. Um, so what is chemsex? Um, well, for us, it's the most significant issue, really, that's happened in our LGBT communities in relation to drug use. And when I say LGBT, it's actually happening within gay and bisexual men and other men who have sex with men, or MSM is the, the phrase we have there. It's not really a pattern of behaviour we're seeing in lesbian or bisexual women. And whilst there are some trans and non-binary people involved in this scene, it's not a pattern that's, that's across the whole of the trans communities. Very simply, it's having sex whilst using drugs. It's using drugs to enhance and facilitate that sexual activity. But it's not the same as when people were just going out clubbing and maybe have some lines of coke, or maybe go dancing, take some pills, get lucky and fall into bed with somebody at the end of the night. Yes, they're having sex on drugs. But this is about the specific intention to meet and take drugs to facilitate that sexual activity. Um, it's characterised by three drugs in particular, uh, uh, methadrone, GHB or GBL and crystal methamphetamine. So we've got two very strong stimulant drugs there and one depressant drug, but that works in similar ways to alcohol. You get the dose right and you get a euphoric effect, but get the dose wrong and as Chris was saying, you can go into, uh, into overdose, you can uh, pass out, go into a coma and at a larger dose it can be fatal as well. GHB and GBL also have dependence properties as well, which we didn't realise until a few years ago. And people were coming to us using every day, using every couple of hours, setting their clocks to wake up through the middle of the night to take the drug, to prevent themselves from going into withdrawal. And the withdrawal is particularly harsh, particularly tricky. So when people are using at that dependent level, it is important that they seek medical advice for uh, detox support. Why is it a concern? Well, it's such a marked change in the pattern of drugs that's been used. It was such a, a, a shift in what was uh, coming into our services. The context changed, people are using in that sexual context, but also the methods of use have changed. People are injecting some of these drugs, and injecting drug use was not common in these communities before. Also seen increasing presentations to GUM, sexual health services and other drug services. So people are hearing about this and wanting to know more about it. And the rise of chemsex over the past decade or so that we've been seeing it has also been uh, accompanied by a rise in HIV diagnosis and, uh, and new infections. 
In the last couple of years, the number of HIV infections has dropped rapidly within gay men because we've had such good advances within prevention of HIV through PrEP, through uh, more regular testing, and through uh, earlier initiation of treatment. But for most of this time, the numbers were going up, and so there's an association there. It's also a concern for us because we're seeing an, an emerging link to sexual assault and to non-consensual sex. People are saying, I'm at parties and they kind of pass out or they've taken too much G or they can't quite remember what's happened. And when they come around, they're not sure what's happened. They're not sure who's had sex with them. Or there's new people at the party that they don't remember coming. And so there's a, the, the, it's very confusing. The issue of consent is very clear legally. But people have questions about, well, if I was at the party, was I consenting to have sex with everybody anyway? Well, no, of course you weren't. But people have that perception. So it, it, it's quite a, a tricky area for us. Would this, would this be mainly down to the dissociative effect of GHB? Um, it could be, but also can be the fact that people are passing out. So people yeah. are sometimes carrying on having sex with somebody who's passed out. And even in some cases, the, 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 the boundaries of the play are that somebody will, everyone will take a dose of G and somebody might take a larger dose, but they don't know who's got it and that's the person no. that everybody... Some quite dark fantasies being played out it, it, at times in these communities. Also at the more extreme end of the scale, the uh, chemsex drugs have been linked to a couple of very high profile cases. Stephen Port, who was accused of, oh, charged um, and uh, um, um, uh, convicted of uh, four murders of gay men in Barking and also of administering G to incapacitate his victims to be able to have sex with them. And uh, Gordon Semple, who was a police officer who um, went for a hookup, a uh, grinder hookup, with somebody who'd been using crystal meth for several days and killed him and dismembered the body. It was a particularly gruesome case. Now, they're very extreme ends of the scale. That's not what's happening in most of chemsex, but I just wanted to put that in because it is part of the concern for us. Paul, we don't have any data on trans people, but the official data on lesbian, gay, and bisexual people shows they're much more likely to be using drugs than heterosexual people. We don't get this data very often. It's from the Crime Survey for England and Wales, which is produced every year, but we only get it thrown at us uh, um, broken down by sexual orientation every few years. So this is from 2014. But you can see in men, Gay and bisexual men three times more likely than a straight man to have taken a list of drug in the past year. And for lesbian and bisexual women, it's fewer, but it's more than four times uh, the uh, use by straight women. Would, so this sorry, is a disproportionate... Would this be a particular particular drugs or just no this drugs, is this is across the board in general if this is broken down each drug is higher by lgb people right, as okay. well uh so this is what the data is telling us so already we've got a community that's more likely to be using drugs i'm not going to talk too much about the drugs themselves there but i just wanted to flag this so that people are aware um if you could just this is um, clinical guidance which was produced a couple of years ago called the Neptune Clinical Guidance and the, the website is there for it. It's got information about the uh, management of acute and chronic harms associated with the uh, novel psychoactive substances. So some of the drugs that um, uh, we're talking about here, you'll find much more information there. <coughs> There's also an LGBT <laughs> supplement to that, although I say LGBT, it's mostly about gay and bi men because that's where the majority of the, uh, the research Research is. Um, we can circulate the slides hopefully as well so that people can have these links um, as well. Thanks. That, yeah, so can you just go back one? Yes. This next slide is a bit busy, so I just want to talk you through it. So, yeah, this is a, a, an indication of what we've seen in our service. Drugs down the side, this is what we were seeing in the mid 2000s. 179 clients, and it's broken down to how many of those reported each drug. By 2013, 758 clients, that was a peak for us, and again broken down. The percentages don't add up because people are taking more than one drug. But I just want to highlight, if you could just click this red box here, those three chemsex drugs. We had three people in the mid-2000s who were using G. It wasn't a problem <coughs> drug for very many people. But leap forward and you can see how many more people that was aff uh, affecting and how 
uh, many more were coming into the service with that as an issue. Crystal meth, we knew was going to happen. We had lots of stories about kind of how it had been a big drug in America, um, in parts of uh, Europe, in Australia, South Africa, um, but we hadn't really seen it here yet in the mid 2000s. And again, this is now our number one drug. Um, and methadrone, one of those legal highs that had become a, the most prominent drug at that time. That has dropped off a little bit, but it's been so characteristic of the use uh, in chemsex that we, uh, it still is there as an issue for us. And actually you can see heroin and crack at the bottom there is very little. That's not to say LGBT people aren't using heroin and crack, but they're not coming into our service very much. And I think sometimes, People are saying mainstream services aren't meeting their needs as drug users because so much of the focus has been on heroin and crack for many years because that's where we've seen a, a bulk of the harm. But LGBT people don't feel connected with that, so often won't go into the services. And likewise, I think maybe if an LGBT person is using heroin and crack as involved in that scene, maybe they do feel more comfortable in mainstream services than chemsex and club drug users. <laughs> But, so I want to give a little perspective. This is still a small subset of MSM. It's not the norm. It's not everybody is involved in this. Not all MSM who are using drugs would be engaged in chemsex. Some are using different drugs. Not everybody who's engaged uh, will be experiencing problems with their drug use. Some people are very controlled about when they use, who they use with, what kind of behavior they engage in. But for some, it's much, much more chaotic. What we do feel, though, is there's a disproportionate level of harm with these drugs than there has been within the clubbing scene um, for many, many years before that. And I want to emphasise, don't overlook the role of alcohol. In terms of drug use and leading on to risky sexual behaviour, alcohol is still the most widely used drug. And we know it's a problem within our communities. We do the audit C screening and people who don't even mention alcohol as a prob as presenting substance score highly at de possibly dependent, certainly increasing risk levels. So alcohol is still very in much in the mix with this. So just to put that in a bit more perspective, the data that we have, this is the, probably the best, most recent data. We're waiting for the next round of this, uh, this um, survey, which was done in 2017, to be published. But the data that we have from 2014 shows actually the lifetime use uh, of, of this drug by gay men. 8.3%, about one in 12 had used crystal, uh, about one in um, eight, I think, had used GBL, 12.5%, and 16.5% used methadone, about one in six, I think, there. So it's still, this is whoever's ever used the drug. So you can see it's by no means the whole of the gay community. It's still very much a subset. But when we talk to people, the perception can be if they're in this scene and using every weekend, they fear, well, well, everybody's doing it, everybody's, you know, doing the same thing. In a research study, somebody said, oh, well, 90% of the guys are doing chemsex. Well, no, this data doesn't back that up. But if you've got somebody who's in that scene, it can feel like everybody is, and it can feel really, really difficult to get yourself out of that. There's also a link, sorry, um, between um, HIV. So this was the same survey, and it asked whether people had used chemsex drugs in the previous four weeks, so it was the recency. You can see, it nationally, 6.6 .6 had used chemsex drugs in the previous four weeks, but in London, it was much higher. We've got a more significant problem with this in London. And where men were living with diagnosed HIV, it was much higher nationally and again much higher in London. That's one in three gay men living with diagnosed HIV who were using a chemsex drug in the previous month. That's a lot. That's a really disproportionate issue. So what we're seeing is we're seeing definitely a change towards sexualized use. Chemsex is about 85% of the work that we do in our antidote service. Uh, so the rest of the work would be alcohol and other drugs. But chemsex is about 85% of the, the harms that we're seeing. We're seeing people meeting through apps to uh, connect, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. And we're seeing people trading drugs through the apps as well. 
People are telling us that this activity is happening mainly in private um, uh, um, venue, pr private parties at homes or in hotel rooms. Some is happening in sex on premises venues like saunas uh, and uh, entertainment establishments, clubs and bars, etc., that have a sex on premises license. But most of this is happening in private uh, parties. When people present to us there's a high level of current sexual risk, uh, condomless sex, multiple partners, um, etc., and more risky sexual practices. And as I mentioned, injecting has become more common with these two particular drugs. Um, interestingly, the word for injecting has become slamming. People say, oh, I, I slam my drugs. And we reflect that back and say, oh, so you're an injecting drug user. And sometimes that's a realization. Sometimes people are using this language, which isn't the traditional language of thinking about what injecting drug use means. They've invented this new word to kind of put a different, uh, sh a different sheen on it. A very strong association with being HIV positive, as I said, and that association with HIV transmission and other STIs. So there is a risk there. And as I mentioned, much more problematic than um, previous club drug use. So what role does it play? If there are all of these harms and risks associated with chemsex, why are people doing it? It's fun. Most drug use, people are using them because it's fun. People are using this to enhance sex. They tell us they've had the most incredible sexual experiences. They felt really horny. They felt really attractive. People have desired them. It's taken their inhibitions away. It's quite a heady mix of pleasure. The feeling of the drug, the intense high, and the intense pleasure and intimate experience. That's what people are, 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 are seeking when they're doing this. As I mentioned, it's a disinhibitor, um, and it reduces some of the anxieties that people have around their sexual identity. Lots of people say they feel anxious about being intimate with other people, or they feel, you know, they've been brought up to feel that being gay is wrong, or gay sex is wrong in some way, and it can, can take some of the anxieties away that people um, feel about that. Um, very, very strongly, we see an association with identity as a gay or bisexual person and belonging to a community. Lots of people tell us they come to London, they get involved in the club scene and they feel as though they find a group of friends and they have this very intense, intimate experience and they feel as though they belong somewhere. And that's quite a, again, a beguiling mix. It kind of sort of pulls you back in because the, if the alternative to that can some be, sometimes be to remove yourself from that sense of community that people are getting from chemsex. <clears throat> For some people, there's a sense of ritual. Uh, particularly, we know that injecting drug use can involve a sense of ritual, but that sort of preparing the drugs or sharing the drugs, sharing the experience together can be um, uh, quite a, a draw for people. And of course, the intimacy that people get. For some people, it's sexual experimentation. It allows them to engage in sexual behavior and sexual acts that they might not have uh, engaged in before, uh, or they might be uh, more, you know, more experimental um, about that. But we are seeing a level of subsequent regret. People are saying, well, you know, I kind of, once, I, once it was Tuesday morning and I was thinking about it, I, you know, did I really want to stay up all weekend from Friday to Monday morning? Did I really want to have sex with that many people? Can I, re can I remember what happened? So there is a bit of regret when people reflect on their behavior. And where we see chemsex becoming a problematic issue, we see a strong link with existing poor self-esteem. That's not to say that chemsex causes it, but if people are already not feeling very good about their identity as LGBT people, and remember, we've grown up with such discrimination, such prejudice uh, throughout our lives. The guys here are 30, 40, they'll be products of the 70s and 80s, when Section 28 was, uh, was, was prevalent, when there was lots more discrimination uh, against gay people. We've grown up in a, in a world that's only legitimized our relationships within the past 10 to 15 years through civil partnerships and same-sex marriage. So that self-esteem is, is, is there. It's quite intrinsic for lots of um, uh, LGBT people. And if that's already there, we see a strong association with when chems become problematic. Why is it suddenly prominent? Well, we've had such a change in the drugs availability. So 
there was a big seizure of the precursor chemicals for MDMA or ecstasy in the mid-2000s and the global supply pretty much dried up and what was available was really bad quality so people were moving to alternative and people were putting alternative substances into pills and selling them as ecstasy. But it's also combined with the fact that you could um, go online and you could buy these drugs. You could buy GHB, GBL, you still can online buy GBL. You could buy methadrone legally and you could have it sent to your door. So people were finding these drugs, they were more readily available, they were cheap. A litre of G GHB, GBL, you can get for under £100. It's a milliliter a dose, so you're talking at less than 10p a dose. It's a very, very cheap, efficient drug. So that was another, one of the reasons why people were moving on to these. The new technologies, like the apps, which I'm going to mention in a moment, have allowed people to seek out specific sex and seek out specific sexual partners. And also our LGBT community has changed quite a lot. We know across the country there's a number of pubs and uh, community centres, etc. closing down. That's been particularly prevalent in the LGBT community in London. Uh, the sense of places where we can go and connect, uh, just the, the range just aren't there anymore. About 60% of the LGBT venues have closed down in the past five or six years. So I mentioned the apps. I want to just talk a little bit about this. So, can you just stop there for a moment? So a couple of years, or a few years ago, uh, has anybody heard of Gaydar? Gaydar was like a dating site. It was, uh, allowed you to put your profile up and you could match with other people and you could send them messages and you could meet up for a date. It was all computer-based. Now, of course, it's all here in our pockets and in our mobile phones. So we've got apps like Grindr. Uh, this is the most prevalent one, if people haven't seen um, that. This is a, a sample screen. It allows you to put your profile in. Your photo will come up in the top left corner. And then it will show you photos of people who've got profiles on their phones. And it will show you in proximity to how close they are to you. So um, if you, just on the grinder one, um, basically, I mean, this just exploded about 10 years ago. Um, Everybody seemed to have Grinder, and suddenly the gay men were popping up everywhere. I remember going to my mum's, who lives up in Newcastle, and I put Grinder on, and there were all these gay men within a kilometre of where I'd grown up. And I'm thinking, where the hell were all of you when I was 18? <laughs> you know, I thought, definitely thought I was the only gay in the village. <laughs> but it just, was, it just was amazing. Suddenly, all of these people were accessible. That, that just hadn't been necessarily visible before. So you've got different ones. You've got Gay Romeo, which is more prevalent in many mainland Europe so a lot of guys will have it on their phones here for when people are coming to London on holiday they'll be able to hook up with them um, there's Manhunt there's over 35,000 men online now with Manhunt that'll keep you busy till tea time um, if you like your men a bit more rough and burly there's a, an app called Scruff which is for more masculine men um, if you like a bit of slap and tickle there's fetish profiles on recon so you can go for that kind of sex and if you like there's, there's growlers, or growlers for, for bears, which are big, hairy gay men, so that's where you'll find me hanging out most of the time. <laughs> but I just, I wanted to put that up because I wanted to reflect on the diversity there. You can get an app for the kind of man you're interested in. You can get an app for the kind of sex you're interested in. So people are using this to their advantage to try and find chemsex partners uh, and you can you although you're not legally allowed to put it on there people do put it on their profiles in various ways so the first one here people might use these emojis the little syringe and pill emoji might be a coded message that you're into chemsex people use pnp which means party and play which again is a coded message that that might be what you're into and people use these H and H, high and horny, it means, or three guys playing or four guys chilling. And that's an indication that there's a group of you there and you're looking for other people to, to join you. And the, 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 the words you use can, um, can help with that. I'm not sure if you'll see this at the back, but this is the profile. I've taken the, the guy's photo out for, you know, protect his modesty. But you can see grown man at the top with the G and the M emphasized and then underneath the photo it says grown man to love the g the m the t and the v are highlighted so that would be g for ghb gbl m for methadrone 
T for Tina, which is a slang for crystal. Um, and then the V would be Viagra, because if you'd had that kind of cocktail, you would need a little bit of help after that. But I mean, GMTV, well, that was morning television when I was growing up. It was L <laughs> Lorraine Kelly on the telly. Um, but this is, a, this is just one, another example of how people are creative about putting that, that, um, that, that um, message in. Now this is um, a message that, this is somebody's message to me, never met the person, um, I have no idea who they are, but the first message they send is, um, I've got good chems and Charlie, so Charlie for cocaine, I've got good deals in quality, you interest them. I, you, you don't know who I am. There's nothing on my profile that says anything about chems, but still you get that. Well, I can't help replying to these sometimes. So I send a message back. So, They're not my scene, but you know, I'm chief executive of this charity. So if you do know anybody who's got any problems, <laughs> send them our way. It, it opens up some interesting conversations sometimes, but it does get me blocked from time to time as well. And just, just before we click on this one, again, this is somebody's opening message to me. Never met them before. And the first thing they say to me on the app is, filthy chemmed up barebacking cigar smoker here. That my, the art of romance is not dead. And I just thought, I mean, the cigar smoking is, is a fetish thing. For, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fetish thing on the gay community for some people. But basically somebody, barebacking is condomless sex. So basically somebody there is saying, I've taken a load of drugs and I want to have sex with you without a condom. And that's the first message to me. I thought if I was standing in a bar, would you have come up to me and said that? Well, actually, some, some bars you might have, yes. But um, no, you wouldn't generally. It's changed the way in which we communicate. It's changed the boundaries and the barriers in which gay men are connecting. And I wanted to reflect that really because people are using these apps to find chems, to find chem sex parties. People that we work with are finding it difficult to avoid being offered chems when they go on the apps. And the apps are here to stay. They're the new way of meeting people. So it's impractical for somebody who's trying to escape chem sex to say, well, just don't go on the apps. This is a way that people can connect and find dates. And lots of people will put no chems in their profiles. Lots of people say no hookups, that's no casual sex. They'll say, no, I want to meet for a date, the old fashioned way. So people can use these apps in the way that they want to for positive forces as well as more negative. But there are some negative consequences in terms of the relation to chem sex. We're also working with men who tell us they, would, they only were offered drugs by somebody they went to meet through a grinder hookup. And they wouldn't necessarily have come into contact with drugs and then regular circle of friends. So the apps have opened up that possibility of networking to a lot, a much more diverse range of men. So people are finding themselves in a situation where they're being offered drugs, where they know nothing about taking them, where they know nothing about the risks, where they know nothing about injecting, so other people are injecting them. So it, it, it's quite messy. It's become quite a challenge for us. So I just wanted to mention a little link with sexual health. This is some information that came from St George's Hospital in South London last year. They did uh, studies across um, a very large patient group over a number of years. And they found that um, if you, men were engaged in chemsex, they were five times more likely to have a new HIV diagnosis than men who weren't engaged in chemsex. They were nine times more likely to be diagnosed with hepatitis C than men who weren't engaged in chemsex, and four times more likely to be diagnosed with another STI. So a very clear uh, link there to the, the increased level of risk behaviour that's happening associated with chemsex. Also linked to that as well, this is quite busy as well, so let me talk through it. Um, also in St George's last year, they looked at a number of harm indicators um, where people were involved in chemsex but where crystal was part of the drugs used or where crystal wasn't one of the drugs used. And in all of those indicators, much, much greater levels of reported harm where crystal was involved. So more likely to um, uh, report a negative consequence uh, in general, um, greater levels of mental health, more likely to have time off work, more likely to have overdosed, more likely to have an impact on your relationship or um, have a hospital admission or have involvement with the criminal justice system and actually 
involvement with the criminal justice system across the board in the LGBT drug using community is not a huge issue because there's not that association with acquisitive crime like there is with heroin and crack. Um, but also financial consequences greater with crystal as well. So within chemsex use, crystal in particular has emerged for us as a really, really significantly harmful drug. Where we're working with people, it's definitely the hardest drug we've ever worked with in terms of how it impacts on people, how it activates their triggers, um, how it um, uh, impacts on lapse and relapse. Um, so it's a, it's a real challenge. And I think the mental health aspect that's associated with that as well, you're going to have mental health impacts from being awake for several days using these stimulant drugs. If that's happening every weekend, you know, but over a prolonged period of time, we are starting to also see drug-induced psychosis as very closely associated with Crystal, and also um, sections under the Mental Health Act, again, associated with Crystal. And these are things which weren't really happening in the drug and alcohol community, LGBT communities um, a decade ago, certainly 15, 20 years ago, which is the, as long as our antidote service has been in the game. So some additional factors just to pick out, the, um, the uh, European Chemsex Forum, which held its second conference last year in Berlin, first was in London two years ago, um, reports there coming through that loneliness and boredom and its lack of community and a sense of, but lack of sense of belonging, very, very strongly associated with the drivers that men get involved in chems uh, for. And that is one of the big problems with us. When we're removing people from the chems environment, we're having to look at other things to, act to, to activate, to, to um, um, employ their time with. Um, and also, again, coming through in the re emerging research, that non-consensual sex is, is a, a recurring problem. So anecdotally, but also starting to come through into the research there now as well. So just a summary of how things have changed. Different drugs being used, different routes of administration, the context become mainly sexual in gay men, uh, different and new harms in our communities, injecting harm, dependence on G, and mental health and psychosis. Uh, Crystal being the most difficult drug there, and there's increasingly complex associations with mental health. Uh, just before we close, I want to just give you a bit of uh, information about our services so you know uh, what we've got on offer. So we um, have walk-in assessments. The easiest way for somebody to come to our service is to come to our walk, one of our walk-in assessments. Soho on a Thursday night, uh, King's Cross on a Monday morning. All the information's on our website about times and locations. Um, when people come in, they'll get a full assessment and we'll talk about the full range of services that are on offer. So we'll start putting a care plan together there and then. They may have to wait for one-to-one -one work, they may have to wait for a group to start, but we'll start doing some work with them there and then. As I mentioned, one-to-one -one key work we can uh, do, helping people look at their use, look at what their goals are for their using. We work with people who are wanting to become abstinent, but we also work with um, harm reduction if people are looking to gain more control. Think about the times that they use, who they use with. Uh, if they want to say, actually, I want to do chems, but I only want to do it like maybe once a month, we'll work with them around those goals and see if, we can, if they can reach that. Sometimes people do find that they have to give up and controlled use isn't such an easy thing for them. Um, complementary therapies as well and um, uh, we have a counselling service which people can refer in to look at any of the, the underlying issues. Two group programmes, uh, ChemCheck and SWAP and the next slide just talks about those. So ChemCheck is it's a six week um, more health promotion based program using uh, motivational interview and CBT techniques. I guess for there we're looking at risk, we're looking at behavioural change and we're looking at kind of that motivation to change. So a good course if somebody is thinking about making some changes or wants a bit more information or a bit more encouragement. Um, we're also talking about responsibility and consent so people are still engaged and going to parties. We're saying, you know, look out for the other people there. Be aware of the, the, the boundaries around consent. SWAP is our Structured Weekend Antidote Programme. Uh, it's a full weekend programme, eight days. It's a very intensive therapeutic programme. Uh, it's the only one of its kind in the world that we know of. Um, 
And for that, people need to have a bit of recovery time. So we'd be looking for at least a month uh, abstinence and abstinence throughout the programme, even if after that people want to go on to controlled use. Looking at uh, relationships, identity, self-esteem, intimacy, sex and sober sex, um, being sex positive as well, because we don't want to take one aspect of somebody's sex life away and make it dull for them uh, and also thinking about social engagement and we have a peer support element um, to that as well um, I'm just going to, oh this is um, what Anna mentioned, the friends and family um, uh, resource that we did last year we were getting a lot of calls from parents or from partners or from friends or other family members of people who were engaged in chemsex and not really knowing what to do about it, how they could support their, their loved ones. So we worked with ADFAM, uh, the uh, family support uh, charity, uh, to bring our respective expertise together um, on that. Uh, we did some pilot support groups. We had some good outcomes from that, but lower attendance than we'd hoped for. So we're not sure what's going to quite happen with the future of them. There's, the outcomes are really positive, but whether there's the demand for it, I don't know. But we did produce this lasting resource, which can be downloaded from our website, and it's also on um, ADFAM website as well for some resources for um, family members. I'm going to really skip through this. Oh, just key messages to finish with. Um, this is new for many people. So if this is the first time you're hearing about it or you don't know much about it or you're worried about it coming into your services, just saying, you know, this is new. We've had to learn as well. We've learned from our service users coming in. We've very much learned on our feet. Um, but we would really say think about the environment you create. It's really important for people to disclose issues around chemsex that they feel very trusting of the environment and they feel they can all be talk, talking very frankly about the behaviour that they're engaged in. Um, particularly that sexual behaviour. It can be quite embarrassing or quite shameful for somebody to talk about what's happened to them at the weekend. So they need to know that the environment they're coming into is open and they can disclose this very, very personal information. Start appropriate conversations with them. Don't be prurient or voyeuristic about uh, what's going on, but be supportive in their conversations. Find out what their goals are. And knowing what you can support with. We're not expecting everybody to be an expert in everything, but think about the things that you can do well, the skills you already have that you can apply to this work. Now you know a little bit more about the context of it and be aware of the increasing risk that might be there, particularly around G dependency um, or um, increased sexual risk. Um, but being aware of the specialist support that you can refer to as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, our services are there and um, we offer a London wide service. A couple of slides, I'm not going to mention these, just some signposting information, which will be in the slides that we'll circulate um, again around um, support and we've also got on the next one uh, we put a list of resources in there people want to go away and read any more about this so they're in the slides that you can just click through to and uh, our contact details are all up on there as well so Website, email, all the social media. If you follow me on social media, you'll have to put up with me blethering on about the Eurovision Song Contest just as much as I do about LGBT issues. Uh, that's my other passion. But we've even got, you know, we answer the phone still as well, the good old-fashioned dog and bone, if you want to give a ring and talk to somebody rather than connect digitally as well. So please do feel free if people have questions or, you know, want to refer people in, um, you know, give us a, give us a shout and we'll be happy to, to support you and support your clients.